Hi everyone, good morning and welcome to the next VTIC webinar um, and the latest in our series of webinars. This morning is all about do soft skills matter in the tourism business? And we've got about an hour set aside for Gavin Norris, the director of the 3E Factor, um, to talk to us today all about soft skills. Gavin's got an amazing work history, including corporate, small business work, consulting, and not only that, he's also been involved in performance business and executive coaching way back since 2002. So a wealth of experience, and we're really wrapped that Gavin can join us today. So Gavin, good morning. Welcome, uh, welcome to people um, today for the soft skills uh, webinar. <clears throat> one of the um, one of the first things I'd like to uh, look at is do so, uh, so our titles do soft skills matter in business and the first thing is to say well how are soft skills different um, to other skills what I see in this sense is that we have we have three competencies essentially we have a technical competence which may be how we do our job how we um, uh, the technical competence is basically the things that you need to do to perform your job, which may be the certifications, it might be if you have to have particular licences or if you're a tour guide, having the uh, being members of uh, <coughs> professional associations, etc, etc. The social competence is the soft skills and the social competence are the things that are that are very important to your business in the sense of how you relate to people, how you um, manage your staff, how you manage your emotional intelligence, your awareness of people, um, how you influence others, how you lead others, um, <clears throat> how you are able to go out and present a case where you may want to have partners around your business. So those sort of skills around the, are the soft skills. In terms of the third area is business competence and the business competence is your awareness of tourism, your ca capacity to be um, commercially savvy, commercial um, acumen, um, how you build the structure for your business, how you plan ahead for your business, how you develop products for your business, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. That's the business competence. So the area that I'm looking at is soft skills and it's the social competence. So <clears throat> if we move on from that. Yeah, just, just while you do that, Gavin, please, this is really interesting. It's going to be a, a fair bit of detail in this. But, so, guys, please do ask questions as we go through. There's quite a lot of you out there. Um, but don't worry, we'll, we'll try and ask, answer the questions as they come through. Um, Any we're not sure of, we'll, we'll answer at the end of the session. So please don't hesitate to drop in your questions and stay with us. Um, because it promises to be a really, really good 45 minutes to an hour coming up. Thank you, Ian. Well, Ian, I might just start with you. Like, what do soft skills mean to you? What would you, how would you define them? Uh, to me, it's all about interacting and interpersonal, interacting with other people, the interpersonal skills, getting on with people, and ideally, you know, using your soft skills to actually get the best out of your team, be they your superior, you know, the, those working above you, uh, alongside, and, and also any staff you might have as well. I think it's getting, to me, that's what soft skills are all about, using those inherent little parts of, of, your, of your mind to actually get the best out of yourself and, and your team players. Do we, is there any questions people might have about what soft skills are? If you'd like to, um, if you'd like to send your questions at this time, we can have a talk about that and we can answer the questions as we go through the, the presentation. Um, that was really good, Ian, in terms of how, what you were thinking about in terms of what soft skills are. I do have a, you will see it on the screen, a uh, definition of what soft skills are, and that is personal attributes that enable someone to interact effectively and harmoniously with other people. So it's very much around how you how you relate to people and how you manage your emotions and those sort of things. Now, what I'd like to do would be, um, <clears throat> so the first part of this is 
emotional intelligence, which I will be going through a little bit later, and that's about social, your self-awareness and your social sensitivity. The second, uh, the second element that I see in terms of soft skills is it's around the communication framework, uh, the communication styles, because there are different styles of communication, and also around collaboration and how we share ideas. The third element is around strength-based leadership, both in terms of how we optimise ourselves and play to our strengths, and secondly, how we put together high-performing teams. Oh, actually, that's a really, actually, Michelle out there has just asked a really good question, actually, relating to the high-performing teams. Uh, Michelle has asked about, when interviewing for new staff, are there certain questions that can test emotional intelligence? That's a really good question in terms of, well, how would I test for emotional intelligence? Well, um, a few things in terms of how you test for emotional intelligence in an interview situation would be, um, is uh, do you feel connected to that person? So are you is the person uh, showing their emotions? Are they expressing themselves or are they very um, uh, unemotional? If they're unemotional, it probably means that they're not very um, emotionally intelligent because emotional intelligence is about how we express ourselves. It's self-expression and it's also like in the in the interview, it, it may be about when you may pose some difficult questions, people are able to express, well, hang on, I feel a little bit uncomfortable here and that's okay to feel that way. So how will you see emotional intelligence? You will see it. You'll see it in terms of um, what are you feeling in that interview situation. You'll also see it in terms of people's faces and gestures and the way they may be sitting, et cetera, et cetera. That's great. Thank you, Gavin. Yeah. <clears throat> so when we look at the soft skills, like we talk about strength-based leadership, and we also look at um, what are our values and beliefs? What are the ethics? What's the integrity? How do we make a difference? Are we a person who gives to others and helps other people succeed? Now, I'd like to start with emotional intelligence. Um, emotional intelligence essentially breaks into two areas. One, it's the emotional intelligence around how you self-manage yourself. That is your self-awareness. It's about the emotions and feelings that you are feeling yourself. It's also, <clears throat> it's also, do you accurately have a self-assessment of your emotions? Like you might say you're very emotionally uh, intelligent, but that may not be the case, which would mean it would not be an accurate self-assessment. The third thing is self-confidence, self-control. In terms of emotional intelligence, you appear as confident and you're able to control. Like if, you're, if you are getting angry or if you, whatever the emotion is, you're able to self-manage that and not, not spin out and you know, go into um, emotionally dramatic situations. Uh, another part of emotional intelligence is trust and innovation, those sort of qualities. And also emotional intelligence will feed commitment and optimism and achievement drive. It tends to direct you to put that energy in um, to make it go well. The social sensitivity side is what's external to you. And that is mm. <clears throat> practicing empathy with someone, um, understanding that someone might be um, uh, feeling sad or there might be some grieving or whatever. But also in terms of empathy, when you look at tourism, it's about the service orientation, where um, if you're actually being a tour guide or even if you're just take, taking the first call when someone's wanting to engage with you, um, that they, they feel they're being... Um, listen to, they feel that that person wants to make it a great experience for them once they sign on, et cetera, et cetera. So that's the empathy stuff. The other part of this social sensitivity is social skills, and that is how do I influence others? How do I communicate with people? How do I lead people? How do I handle change? Can I be a change catalyst? Um, I just wonder, um, when you look at that, we might just have a question, Ian, in terms of, 
what do you feel about social skills and particularly in tourism? What's yeah, it mean? I think it's, I think a lot of it too, as far as I'm concerned anyway, is being aware. It's the whole self-awareness aspect, not only of yourself, but also be aware of other people's feelings or, or what you anticipate some of those other feelings might be. Um, it's it's really an awareness of, and you'd get that through watching, through learning, a fair bit of history as well, but it's really just being aware of what other people are doing, what they might be feeling. Uh, actually, there was another question there as well. Um, can emotional intelligence be taught as an adult or does it need to be addressed when young? So I guess is it something you can learn it's, um, or, do, do you have, or do you just have it? Um, well, it's a really good question. The big advantage about emotional intelligence is that you can learn it, you can develop it, as opposed to when you look at IQ, as you get older, it goes one way and it's not up. Um, where emotional intelligence, as you grow and as you process the emotions and feelings that you have, you can actually grow your uh, emotional intelligence, which is great because you are not locked in. If you've got low emotional intelligence, that's fine. I actually, um, as Ian mentioned, I coach people and it's one of the first things I do in the coaching is emotional intelligence. And what I find is that when I'm coaching them, they all develop their emotional intelligence over a period of time, whether that be three months or six months or whatever. So it's tremendous in that way. So, yes, we can um, develop that. Yeah, Actually, we've, Gavin, it's funny, you know, we've just had a lot of comments come in from Michelle, Peter, Stephen, and also Alistair have also all come in. They're all saying listening skills are really, really important. Keep those comments coming in, people. We're loving to get them. It's really interesting. So, so tell us a bit about listening skills. Can you well, improve the, on the, those yourself? What, what, are those, what are some well, hints or the, tips? The, the listening skills really, really essential. Like when you're having a conversation with someone, it's pretty obvious that some people uh, are very much engaged in the listening and that listening can be in terms of like if you're having a conversation, the other person is able to come back to you and say, oh, now... Um, <clears throat> Jerry, is that what you mean here? Or, you know, it could be Michelle. Michelle, you've just spoken about this. Um, do you mean, this is this is what I'm hearing you say, is that what you intended? Um, and that will make the other person feel really good because A, they'll, be feel, they'll feel that they're listened to. I would say today that listening skills are critical and that they are not used as often as they could be. Most people don't really listen. Lots of times people have a conversation. You, you might be speaking and the other person is thinking, okay, how am I going to respond to that conversation? And that's not listening. It's just, you know, a bit of banter, you might say. Cool. Is there another question there, Ian? Uh, probably more of a comment, uh, I think, was the last okay, one. Okay. Uh, if you have a low EQ, you don't even yeah. realise you do not have it. Well, that's, that is really a, that's a tremendous question because... Um, most people, what I find with the coaching is that most people, um, when I focus on emotional intelligence, that's when they start to say, well, hang on, now I, now I know what all this stuff is. And it might be that the people disconnect from them. They were not aware of why people were disconnected. And it, was, it may have been that they had certain um, emotions that may have been too strong and people closed down and didn't want to have much to do with them. Yeah. We do have two ears. <laughs> we do have we have two ears, two eyes, and one mouth, and that's very true. It's it's tremendous in that you know being able to see things and to be able to maybe you know given that you've got two ears, that should mean that you um, <clears throat> you are listening twice as much at least uh, more than when you are talking. Yeah. Actually, John's asked the question as well about, um, about saying, it basically made the comment that many of our visitors that, the, you know, that our members have um, are from various cultural backgrounds, different countries, and they're saying, are there any tips or hints in terms of the social skills that, we, that you can recommend on that? Well, it's interesting because you will have a lot of people coming, you know, in terms of tourism, I suppose, many of the tour operators would have, <clears throat> um, you know, be catering for well, there's uh, the people Europe, from Europe and Europe, different languages Europe and, and China. And, and, and there's also a very yeah, big growing yeah, Chinese yeah. market. The China market so, is really taking off. Yeah. And that's where the emotional intelligence can really help these people because 
regardless of what language you speak, there is one common language, and that's emotional intelligence. So if you're able to pick up in terms of when you're dealing with people, um, you will see the way they are standing. You'll see that you look at their face. You look at um, what are some of the, um, you're, you're looking at, um, are, they, are they getting frustrated? Like if, you, if you're communicating with them and they're still not changing the facial expression, it probably means that you haven't hit the mark and they, 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 they're feeling confused. And so the language, as I say, the emotional intelligent language mm. is a common language around the world. Yeah. And so if you're reading people, you're reading the body, reading how they're standing, reading how they're sitting, reading their, their arms and hand movement, et cetera, et cetera, even their ears, um, all of those things contribute to about are you hitting the mark or are you staying disconnected? And that's a very important part for tourism because many of your target audience will be non-English speaking people. Absolutely. So it certainly can help them a lot. Yeah. Actually, we have another question here from Stephanie. Um, we all know someone who has laid the charm on too thickly. Um, present company excluded, of course, I'm sure. Um, so I'm sure that's what, that's what Stephanie's talking about anyway. Now, where does emotional intelligence begin and end, Gavin? Emotional intelligence, uh, again, what I say to the people I coach, it's a, it's a journey. It never ends. It's something that you do once you, you get involved in emotional intelligence. It's about you work at it. You work at growing your emotional intelligence. And it's about, it, it is the journey. It's part of your life journey. And the better you can get, uh, the better you can develop your emotional intelligence, the more influence you'll have and the better career you'll have and the more the better relationships you'll have. For instance, I've been coaching a gentleman over the last three or four years and he was a middle-level manager. He now is destined to be a CEO of an ASX company, uh, Top 200, <clears throat> and he's gone from middle management. The big thing he took on board was he embraced the idea of emotional intelligence and to grow it, and in the first six months, he doubled his level in terms of rating of emotional intelligence, mm. and it was incredible. And he's he's a big influence in his in his company, and he's going to go into something. So, EQ and emotional intelligence has been massive for him. That's great. Yeah, keep those questions <coughs> coming. In. Questions and comments yeah. coming in, people. Please. Comments, uh, uh, because we're changing slides. Certainly, if there's something that does interest you about emotional intelligence, all that sort of stuff. I'm very happy to um, answer any question that's coming in. Um, the second part of that uh, soft skills was what I called communication styles. And communication styles is something that has been developed um, uh, about 20 years ago or more. And it was, uh, a, it was developed to help people communicate better um, or present their case better. Initially, it was developed for people in sales and it was developed by a gentleman called Larry Wilson. Um, <clears throat> what I've got on the, this slide here is I've talked about the C-suite, and the C-suite is uh, your senior executives in a business, and those people could be the CEO, the uh, you know, chief executive officer, chief financial officer, chief supply officer, could be chief marketing officer, blah, blah, blah. That's what I call the C-suite. Now, if you look at that diagram, it's got four quadrants. The quadrants are based on, um, is the person very focused on getting the project done, the task or whatever, or is the person much more focused around people, being connected to people? On the horizontal plane, it's about, is the, and that represents assertiveness, and on the right-hand side, that is tell assertive, is the person telling or is the person asking in terms of how they demonstrate their assertiveness? Now, the context of it, all this is that we end up where we've got four quadrants and those quadrants represent certain behaviours about how people want to commu be communicated with. The first one being driver, and as you'll notice there, 60% of the C-suite are drivers. Drivers like uh, quick communication. They don't like emotionally to get too emotionally involved in the communication. 
They want, uh, they want to know what's the risk, how long is the project going to take, how much is it going to cost, what are we going to get as a return on investment, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And it's, it's very much summary. So uh, a, a CEO or a driver type person would want information where they might, um, five pages might represent the whole business case. And that's all I want to look at. And I say yes or no, I make a decision fairly quickly and it could be a multi-million dollar or it could be a very substantial um, project, but that's how they operate. That's how they like to be communicated with. The expressive is different. And just on that, um, Ian, have you seen this sort of these sort of quadrants before um, in terms of the communication style, or have you noticed that in tourism about how executives may communicate or whatever? Like, what's your thought on yeah, that? There's, there's yeah, there's a range. I mean, and I've worked with a range of executives over the years who have had all these different styles. Um, some have been very you know, autocratic and pushed it through and, and, and made their decisions and just basically ordered and forced them through. But I think what I've always found is that those who get the, those execs that get the best out of their people are much more on the explanation side, the expressive side of things. Uh, so it's, it's telling but not ordering. Um, yeah. Actually, Peter has just asked a question as well. Just it just come through now. Can you be a poor communicator? I think it's probably related to some of the, you know, to a communication style. Yeah. Uh, can you be a poor communicator? communicator but have excellent or really good soft skills. I mean, um, how vital are they? Is it important without the communication? Or if not? you don't have the communication, your soft skills are missing substantially. Mm -hmm. The communication is very, very important um, because if you, if you look at how we work, how we work, typically we work with people. So it's about if I, if I have good soft skills and I have good communication skills, I'm able to make a request to someone and they will want to help me and they'll carry out the task or whatever. I'll negotiate with them and they will want to help me be successful and I'll help them. If I'm not able to communicate, it really means I have to do a lot of the work myself and I will be separate and I'll be, it's a very hard way to work and to live and yeah communication styles um, being well not communication styles per se but communication is very elementary a very elementary part of soft skills sure yeah. a few other comments and questions are coming thank you Kerry thank you Ben thank you John and Jason also I see now uh, actually Ben's made a comment as well I think his war is referring possibly to um, how can you approach improving the skills of your boss? You know, well, your boss you think is just maybe not doing the right thing. Can you, how can you impact upon what the way your boss's communication style might be? Um, well, probably you need to, if you look at your boss's communication style, you need to look at, well, okay, is he a driver? Is he an expressive? Is he an amiable? Is he an analytical? And also you've got to say, okay, well, what am I? Am I a driver? Am I an expressive? Etc. Etc. Once I work that out, then I can say, well, if my boss is an analytical, he will always or she will always want a lot of information, a, a massive amount of information. It could be where a driver may want five pages, an analytical may want 150 pages, and where a driver will, you'll have a, you'll present. And it might be 20 minutes and the driver said, okay, we'll go for it. Um, the analytical will probably have many meetings and the analytical will be slow to make a decision. Mm -hmm. I want all this information. Um, and so, um, so if your boss is an analytical and you're a driver or you're an expressive, you have to communicate at, you have to communicate in the context of your boss. And if you're able to build that up and start to get good communication, it may be when you're feeling confident, you might say to your boss, you know what, um, I've, been, I've noticed that you know, there's something called uh, communication styles. Um, I find that when I'm communicating with people, I try and understand what their style is. 
And so if you can actually use your soft skills to share with your boss, it may be that they'll say, well, hang on, what's this communication style stuff? They'll get to understand whether they're an analytical or whatever, and they may pursue that and ask you, well, how could I communicate better? Mm. And that might be a, a way to get your boss on board. Sure. Yeah. Sue's just made a comment about some people prefer pictures, others are words. Yes. Where do the pictures people fit in is what Sue's asking. Um, picture people. I would have said in terms of pictures that you, you'd probably find that they'd be more in the expressive yeah. quadrant. Yes. Yeah. I think, yeah. I think yeah. Sue was heading yeah. towards that yeah. direction. Yeah. 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 Uh, thank you. Okay. So if we look at expressive, when, when we... When we look at, say, the tell, assertive and, and the people aspect, expressives um, are well suited to being in sales, marketing, business development. They're the sort of people who will be right out there, um, but they do want to get a big part of their a big part of their being is they are very expressive and they're very emotional. And that can be both in a plus and minus sense. Um, the research would show for expressives that they can get quite judgmental and they will, they will blame people in their negative behaviour or what they call backup behaviour. Moving on, amiable, as I've said there, they're teachers, counsellors, HR. They're people who want to actually connect, uh, work out where we agreed, how we're going to proceed, all that sort of stuff. Very consensus-based, um, slow to make decisions, and the same with analytical, as you can see there. You've got business analysts and statisticians, actuaries, uh, data scientists. Um, they want information. They, they want numbers and numbers graphs and, and numbers tables and facts and, and, and figures and, and, you know, it's almost like you write the Bible to um, connect with these sort of people. Oh, there is a, there's a lot of people out there who love a good spreadsheet. <laughs> <laughs> uh, listen, so, leave our office uh, one of those. Absolutely. <laughs> Actually, that, there's another uh, question now from, um, I've just lost that question now. Reese made a good, good one. Uh, which was great content so far. Thank you, thank you, um, Reese, for making that comment to Gavin. Uh, tell me, how do I, how do I know that I have improved my EQ? Any self checks you can put in place? Well, it's interesting because um, there, there are a few things you can do. One is um, the, the, probably the best thing to do is to do some EQ assessment to find out what's your baseline, and then um, again, what I do with my coaching when I'm advising people is I say, okay, why don't you have an emotions journal? Why don't you every day check in, start a day, what am I feeling, what emotions are coming up, blah, blah, blah. What is coming up um, during the day, maybe at midday, what's coming up end of day? Do I notice there's changes of emotions? Do I notice that when I have some special events where I might want to um, go and do a presentation somewhere or I've got a meeting that's you know, going to be pretty difficult to manage, what emotions come up for me? So. If you develop an emotions journal, if you actually track your emotions, you can start to see, are my emotions different in the morning? Are they different during the day? Are they different on different? Are they different on Monday versus Friday? Sure. I have found when I talk to people that Monday is quite different to Friday. <laughs> For a number of reasons. <laughs> hey, probably also be, possibly also somewhat I'll give you four and a half for lunch too, Gavin. <laughs> but we won't go there on that one. Um, particularly Friday. <laughs> a couple of comments now from uh, or Ben, Claire, Stephen and John as well have all asked similar sorts of comments and the questions about adapting your communication style to best suit the audience. So you need to understand who they are. And then and then Claire's made the comment, so which is the best communication style that we should be aiming for? Well, the best communication style is if you're actually able, initially you need to um, identify um, and again, there's a book by Larry Wilson, uh, it's called Social Skills or Social Styles. Um, in that book, you, you've got two pages where you can work out what your profile is. There's the four profiles, there's the driver, the expressive, the amiable, the analytical. So you can work out who you are. Now, so you, you might find that you're an analytical, um, but the best way you can communicate is to identify if you're presenting to the driver, so you try and look for the behaviours, what would a driver behaviour look like? Um, and then you have to present as a driver to a driver. So you have to say, okay, well, if a driver wants the content, you know, five pages, not 50 pages, I have to present that way 
I have to present in their social style. And then I hit the mark. Yeah. Good stuff. Thank you. Move on. So we now move on to the strength-based leadership, which is around um, individual, uh, how do you play to your strengths? And it's around, as an individual, how do you cause your individual performance? Strengths has come out from uh, its Gallup of um, done a lot of, uh, well, Gallup care of Dr. Clifton, who worked on strengths uh, for 40 years, um, put this whole platform together. What he found is that when people play to their strengths, they energise themselves um, and they get better quality outcomes. So if you can get to know what your strengths are, you are going to perform a lot better. He also said that you are wasting your money if you are trying to fix weaknesses. And many companies say, oh, they'll do a performance review and say, oh, you're very weak in these areas. We'll focus on that. We'll get you coached or we'll do some training and we'll try and fix your weakness. Well, you're wasting your money. And that's shown. So what you do with your weakness is you manage your weakness, but you actually develop your strengths and you become the best that you possibly can become. So what is strengths about? Strengths actually, there's 34 strengths and there is four different categories of strengths. There's the executing, which is how do, you know, how do you make things happen? There's influencing, how do you sell to a broad audience? There's relationship building, where you are the glue of the team and there's the strategic thinking about understand what could be. Now, in those different categories, people can have strengths in those, they could have strengths in executing, influencing, relationship building, and strategic thinking. And when I say strengths in that, what I do is I do, uh, we, again, we do a, an assessment and we, we get someone's top five strengths. And then we work on those. And that's why I, I, I coach people on their strengths. Now, if we just look at a couple of examples, and I'll just share with what I've discovered with people I've worked with. Um, a, that you'll notice the first one there in executing is achiever. Achiever is someone that typically uh, has a task list, 20 things, 30 things every day, and they tick the box. They tick, 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 and they're focused on doing all the things they wanted to do for that day. They, they develop their list at the start of day or at the end of the day pre, uh, prior. Now, I was coaching someone that um, was an achiever and they, they commented about how, how they, they lived out of town, it was a very cold day, they were out pruning the trees, it was wet, cold, windy, but they, as an achiever, they had written a list and they had to do it. And so when I said, oh, you are an achiever, that's your number one, and they had this big smile and said, oh, now I know why I did this on the weekend. It, it was like, that's how they operate. Now, is there a question there? No, not yet. Okay, okay. So um, just on that, uh, Ian, have you, do you, have you learned much about strengths? Have you heard about strengths or what it is or whatever? Yeah, absolutely, and I think a lot of a lot of what I've seen over the years has been probably more on the on the executing side of things. Um, people who actually you know manage that you know, the really good leaders I've found actually get a good team around them. Yeah, a lot of it is based around the team, and they build the right team to to almost to to look for to fill in gaps that they currently don't don't actually possess. Yeah, yeah, it's almost like what some people say is you recruit your weakness. Yeah. And it's a good way to go because then you build up a team and, and people are going to complement each other in that sense. Absolutely. Yeah. So just on the executing, if people have a lot of executing strengths, they just want to get on with it. They're very much action focused. Let's go and do stuff, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. The influencing, well, that is more about um, it's communication. It's uh, how do I influence a group of people? Um, like, for instance, you might, uh, I have Activator as one of my strengths, and what I find is that I can be in meetings and at the end of the meeting I'll say, okay, well, are you going to do that? You're going to do that. You're going to do that. And it's like Activate. Okay, we've had the conversation. 
how do we go? How do we activate what we talked about? Um, I also have found uh, people who go for competition or have got competition as a strength. They are intensely. They want to win. They 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 find it really hard if they're not winning. And so if you've got someone that's got competition in your team, they want to be the best team out there. And so that can be great um, if that's the case. If you've got competition in another team and you're not part of that team, well, beware because they want to, they want to come out as number one. Again, I had someone who who was uh, – I've done work with Telstra and that, and there's a guy in analytics and there. He had competition and he was – um, he was doing a uh, MBA, and he, uh, part of his whole thing was to get the highest grades in every subject, and that's what he was doing. He had to get the highest grades to yep. be number one, and so you know that's how these sort of things go. Um, actually, just one quick one, Gavin. I, I think a couple of people actually picked up. There might be a minor typo there under the influence. What's a woo? Aha, uh -huh, a woo. Um, a woo is it a typo or is it? A it's 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 no, it's true. It, woo is uh, one of the uh, strengths. Woo is imagine if you're at a coffee, uh, just at a little um, cafe bar or you know the, more the co the coffee machine, and you actually woo people. You get them all excited and you woo them along, and uh, yeah, so it's a way again, it's a way of influencing people. You woo them. You, you woo them. Yeah. Is it possible somewhere, I think um, John has just asked another one. John's actually putting in lots of questions today. Um, how can you build a passion in your team? Well, it's, Where it's, does that sort of fit under under the strength-based leadership sort of headings? Well, it's interesting because um, what actually comes from people playing to their strengths is passion. So if, you, if you're energising yourself and you're really doing great work and, like, if the strengths are causing you to have great outcomes – you will actually be, be, be very energised, and that's that's one of the things that they that that um, the strengths do. They energise people. Gotcha. Thanks, yeah. Gavin. Yeah. Actually, another question. Elsie has asked a question. Thanks, Elsie. Lovely to have you on board. Um, so, are you suggesting, Gavin, to totally focus on your strengths rather than try to build on your weaknesses? He, I think Elsie made a comment. It's a common practice in professional sport these days. It's it, it's really it's a very good comment. Um, Elsie yes, is good you, like that. El Elsie is very good, very very, <laughs> very intuitive there, Elsie. I have to say, um, you focus on your strengths because if you've got your team, you know, like if you're looking at say AFL or something, you know who uh, who's going to kick long, well, short. You know who's going to be, you know more the ball player. You know who's going to take that spectacular mark. So if you're running, you you know, you, you position yourself, your other players know how you operate. And like um, I suppose really, Ian, your your side last weekend, they were playing to their strengths. Absolutely. Just kick the danger field. <laughs> kick the danger field. <laughs> and away you go. <laughs> go cats. <laughs> so if we go on to relationship building, they these people sense you know, the, the morale of the team. So if you've got a team of people, they are the glue. And they're the people who, if you're leading the team, you need to connect to the people with relationship building. They will say to you, you know what, that meeting we had last week was really bad. Everyone just felt so so down in terms of the demands that you were putting or the things you were talking about. They didn't understand what you're doing. You know, maybe we should meet again because it's the, the the morale of the team is very very bad, and so relationship uh, building people they relate well, obviously. And um, some examples I had a person who had five strengths. Her top five strengths were in relationship building. What I found is that when the company would go for a, a social lunch or something, she would be saying, "Where is John?" Why wasn't John told about the, the uh, social occasion? Sure. And, and so it was like herding the cats, you know, to, to ensure that. So the relationship building, very, very important as part of the whole team process. The last one is strategic thinking, which is, again, very important because if you're building product, it's got to be built for tomorrow. So you need strategic thinking, people. Um, I've got a guy I'm coaching who uh, works in Google, he has got four strengths in strategic thinking and it's almost like all the conversation I have with him is around tomorrow. 
Sure. Uh, actually, Brad's just asked a question now. Thanks, Brad, for joining us again today. Um, he, Brad, uh, by reading between the lines on his question, he interviews a lot of a lot of times for you know, for new staff, and occasionally he said he actually passes by the best person for the job to actually go for people who will fit best with the team. Can I comment on that? I think that's a that's a wise uh, practice because you what you need to do when you are recruiting people is you've got to think about the culture, you've got to think about what's the gap, what are you trying to fill? And and that would be a, a key criteria if you're going to optimise your team. Yeah, interesting though, yeah. occasionally you might bypass the best person for you the may, job. You may, and that's, you know, um, the, the thing there is you, you, you keep that best person on the list and maybe next time they get the Guernsey. So we we just we've talked about team. So how do we get the best team result? We need, and this is almost this can be a team, it could be a company. We need strengths in every domain. Yep. So those domains of executing, relationship building, uh, influencing, and strategic thinking. We need strengths in every area if we are going to get the best outcomes. That is essential. And that is. How do you get the best teams? We need strengths across every domain. Absolutely. No. And uh, I think uh, there, there is some. Yeah, Ben's made a comment. Relationship, relationship building equals high empathy. Also, uh, high empathy in, in influencing. Absol comment. Absolutely. Um, it's interesting. Relationship building people, um, they're very good in the empathy, may not be um, good in the selling. But they are, you know, and you'll notice there on the relationship building, there is one strength called empathy, right? But um, they will get the relationship right. But if they're out to present a case and they've got all the relationship building uh, strengths, they may not be the best person to do that uh, presentation or whatever. So maybe a bit too honest, perhaps. Um, yeah, they <laughs> maybe. Maybe. <laughs> I, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> No, they're, they're great to the, you know, great at being friends, but uh, maybe no, they can't actually sort of make them sign on the bottom line if, they, if there's a little bit of doubt on the product, perhaps, or something like it that. It could maybe. be. They, they may, it, it may be that they find it really hard to close the deal. Yeah. Where, you know, because their, their major thing will be how do I relate to people? How's this person going to take me? Like, am I pushing them too hard? Like, they haven't said yes. Maybe, I, they, maybe they need more time. Where, um, you know, maybe a business development person or sales person will they'll try it on and see what comes out, and then they'll say, okay, I'll catch up next time. So, how can soft skills help you? Well, that's a really good question, Gavin. Tell us. So, um, <laughs> the first thing is uh, they provide a foundation, and they can relate around growth mindset, which I will cover. Um, I'll cover the growth mindset in a, in a, in a minute. They uh, help you in the influencing, how you um, organise the business, being a more efficient in terms of the organising, and also how you lead. You will be a much better leader if you've got really good soft skills. They, in terms of the business effectiveness, um, they uh, help in terms of the capability development of the of the group. It, the soft skills will help in the collaboration that you have in the team and, and with all the key stakeholders. And obviously, soft skills help you in your negotiation. And in the final one, it's um, it's yep. it's about uh, self confidence and, and, and self management, and it's about your confidence, it's about your motivation, it's about how you direct yourself, it's about having an awareness around purpose. Now, in terms of the growth, um, the growth um, mindset versus the fixed mindset, this is something that's come out. Um, it was a book uh, that came out early this year by um, Dr. Um, Carol Dweck, and she talked. She did a lot of um, research. She was either at Harvard or one of those top universities, um, and did a lot of research around mindsets. 
and particularly looked at people who, who may have a fixed mindset and people who might have a growth mindset. And there's certain things that she found. With people who have a fixed mindset, they more or less don't really want to invest in the learning and they, they may be really good at certain things, but they don't want to do new things because it might bring them undone. So when there's, they will give up easily and they, they don't see any point, as I say, in terms of making an effort, even if it doesn't work out. They think that's a waste of time. And the other thing is that they, they, um, they don't like feedback. Where a growth mindset is someone who is on a learning journey, they uh, embrace the challenge, they will persist and they will do the best they can. They will be working very hard, um, making that effort to master whatever thing they're trying to do and they seek to get feedback. Sure. I just thought, while you're here, Gavin, if you only just ask the question about fixed and, and, and growth mindset, is there any way or any a nice easy way or a couple of simple questions you can ask in an interview situation to find out which mindset someone's into? Yes. And what sort of person they are? Um, it, you, you obviously you, want to avoid uh, the fixed mindset person. Absolutely. Absolutely. A fixed mindset won't take you anywhere in terms of, you know, a team and, and a business and whatever. Um, to find out a fixed mindset, maybe some of the questions would be about um, <clears throat> how have you coped with change? How do you see change? How do you cope with change? Have you taken on new skills? Have you taken on new skill sets over, yep. your, over your journey, et cetera? Yeah, and then um, using your listening skills to actually sort the wheat from the chaps. Absolutely, and, and it's about how they come back and how they, um, like in the, in the book, one of the examples was um, John uh, McEnroe, who was viewed as a fixed mindset because he blamed the court, he blamed the umpire, he blamed the racket, he blamed the ball. It was never him. And so, you know, and, and like he, he was good at what he did, but he could have been even better if he was open more to the learning and what was going on. He's still a fine tennis player. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. So, um, I, I do a bit of work with one of the guys at Google and uh, what I've found is Google Google have a lot of different teams and they, they got a bit frustrated in that they put a, peop a group of people together and some of the teams that work really well and some teams would cause great outcomes, some teams would cause nothing and uh, it would be very frustrating. They found... They did research over three years. They had a project called Project Aristotle. They looked at 180 teams. They also involved some of the academic institutions in the research, and they found there's three traits that stood out. The first trait was around psychological safety, actually preparing an environment where people could fail fast, so it was a safe place, safe place to take risks. The teams were emotionally intelligent and they had social sensitivity. So that was a key quality in that um, for people to get innovative, create things, they had to feel connected. They had to feel team. So emotionally, emotional intelligence was a very key criteria. And the third one was equal share of voice, and that is everyone in the team was given a chance to express themselves and it was viewed equally. So it wasn't about the boss coming in over the top. Um, all, all ideas were open and they would get the best ideas. And yeah, so the old, the old whiteboard argument, no such thing as a stupid idea. Correct, absolutely. And, 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 no, no, and no, no judgment. No judgment, no judgment mm. at all. And so what that meant, and when you think of Google, like it's a very, very inventive company, it allows, um, you know, so if you're looking at, say, soft skills in startups and all that sort of stuff, if you're in a startup, you, you want to have these sort of things where you can optimise the ideas and action those things quickly and, and develop product and whatever. And that you could look at this in terms of how do you develop your product in your tourism uh, business? Yep. And here we go, moving on. Sorry. Yay. So... 
why, when we look at the soft skills, what, what does it all mean? Um, one of the things um, I said to Ian was that there was a study done by Deloitte and Deakin University in May, and they came up with these four key things. The first thing they said is that soft skill intensive jobs will grow by a factor of two and a half times over all other jobs. They would be, they would represent by 2030, two thirds of all jobs will be soft skill intensive. So one of the questions that, uh, so if you develop your soft skills, it may mean you'll keep your job because um, robots, I don't think we'll have emotional intelligence. So, um, <laughs> just as well for that. <laughs> when they do have emotional intelligence, we have a problem. Absolutely. Um, now, it, uh, what they came out with this survey as well, 42% of all businesses said they need leadership skill development for the digital future. So as we get more into the digital age, you still need those soft skills and they don't go away because we're doing it in a different way. And the last one was demand for soft skills will exceed supply by up to 45%. And that's, as I say, that study was done by Deloitte and it was May this year. Mm. There's another study that I've got which was done in 2015. It was done on behalf of McDonald's in the UK and they found that 500,000 UK workers were held back by lack of soft skills. So if they didn't have those soft skills, they were missing jobs or not being able to be promoted or whatever. Um, the next thing is that 97% of UK employers believe that soft skills are going to be critical to any business or to their business. And 75% of the UK employers believe there's already a skills gap in their workforce. So there's that gap at the moment. And finally, 50% believe that the communication teamwork, which we've just gone through in terms of strength-based leadership and emotional intelligence, are more important than the traditional qualifications, which I defined as the technical competence. So it's all around the soft skills. It's all around people, Gavin, isn't it? Absolutely. It's And, and tourism is the extreme of that. Absolutely. You know, if you haven't got the people stuff in tourism, you won't have a business long in tourism. So how, how can I develop my soft skills? I mean, I think that's, that's really the burning question. They're so important. How, how can we improve? How can we work on them? How can we get them if you don't have them? Well, I think that there are there's ways you can do it. We just need the PowerPoint to work and we can um, get there. The first thing is <laughs> you could find an experienced coach. Um, if you are looking for a coach, it could be someone that, on the one hand, they need to have their content around soft skills and leadership and all that sort of stuff. But they also need to have a business awareness about, you know, where is your business and be able to relate to, you know, if you want to grow your business or if there's different um, difficulties you're having with your business, they can be coaching you in a total sense. So the best way to get that is someone who's run a business, understands the problems that you're facing and also has the leadership and the soft skills, emotional intelligence, all that sort of stuff. The second thing, you could try and you could read books on soft skills, emotional intelligence, strength-based leadership, social styles, et cetera, et cetera. But as you may have found, it's difficult to change a behaviour by studying a book. It's very hard. You can, but it takes incredible discipline and it's the hard way to do it. But it's a possibility. The next one is you network. You actually seek out mentors and uh, you know role models who may be doing the things you would like to become or like to do. So you get advice on how do you get you know the right mentors and how do you build that network, a diverse network, which is going to support you in your business. Final thing is if you, if you want to get started, 
I'm available to offer a free one-hour consultation on Skype or face-to-face -to, -face to the VTIC members if people want to take that up and to learn more about well, what is the, what are the soft skills and how do I get started. Thanks, Gavin. That is well, pretty much the end of the... That's about it. There um, might be some Q&A as well, but... Um, a, few, a few comments, questions come in. I mean, one interesting one. Uh, Michelle, again, has been a really great contributor. Thank you, Michelle. Um, I assess who I employ with... Would I want to spend a day with them? Which is what a great way to assess someone. Absolutely. But but as she points out, but I'd need to have faith in my skills to do this. Yes, that's right. And that's where um, you know learning. It, it, it's really if you can spend a day with someone, you should be in a position to know: a Do you connect to them? Do you want to work with them? And do they have the sort of qualities that you want in your business? So that 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 would be a wonderful way to do it. No. Absolutely, fantastic. Um, well, thanks, Gavin, and thank you to all the people out there who've listened. I mean, I must have about twenty-five or plus people make comments or questions at some stage. So thank you very much for your involvement. Um, hey, as you know, this is just one of a series, a monthly series of VTEC webinars. Our next webinar will actually be taking place on the 20th of September. It's called, all about how to rank number one on Google, and that's presented with our digital partner, Web Firm. Of course, you're a fantastic in helping us out with all of our webinars. We really appreciate the time of, uh, of Reese and the team here at Web Firm. So if ever you think anything digital, um, think Web Firm. But yeah, so do register for that uh, webinar on the 20th, 20th of September. It's on our website. Um, and just before we go, a couple of date reminders for people. So please, I mean, if you have a pen and paper, we are putting this on our um, on our website as well. You'll be able to see this entire webinar and find out about others from our website. But a reminder, the 4th of September coming up, the Victorian Tourism Awards entry is closed for that. The 5th of September is Destination Melbourne's Melbourne Tourism Industry Exchange at the MCG. So jump onto the Destination Melbourne website if you're keen on that event. It is a really, really good one. The 6th of September, the day after that, is our MP is VTIX MPs for Tourism Breakfast at the Sofitel Melbourne and Collins. Again, everything is on the VTIC website, vtic.com.au. The next one is, is the webinar on the 20th of September. Our next mixer series of the Melbourne-based people is on the 4th of October, a brand new venue. The Pullman on the Park has just been refurbished. That's coming up there opposite the MCG, a fantastic uh, venue. Liv and I were down there just yesterday afternoon. It looks absolutely superb. So 4th of October, and I'll hopefully be followed up by another one, and another mixer series on the 1st of November, 29th of November, the VTA AGM. That's one not to miss on the calendar. And then, of course, there's the industry Christmas function. Believe it or not, we're talking Christmas already. 11th of December, uh, proudly brought to you by Destination Melbourne, the Melbourne Convention Bureau, and of course, VTIC. But that's almost it for today. A big thank you once again to Gavin for his time, expertise, and knowledge that he shared with us this morning about soft skills. Gavin from the 3E Factor, his details are still on the screen. And again, another huge thank you to our good friends at Web Firm. We really appreciate your support with this webinar series. So this is Ian McDougall saying thank you and take care. Thank you. Improving the world one webinar at a time.